You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, um, we've the wilderness community has had a long history of advocacy for the designation of wilderness areas. One of the reasons for this particular workshop is to talk more about advocacy for stewardship. But there's a natural transition that's occurred in people's thinking over time. So our next group of speakers will help us to understand what each of these types of advocacies are and how they've transitioned and morphed over time uh, to, to the present day. So with us, we have Mark Miller, who is with the Virginia Wilderness Committee, been very active in wilderness designations in the state of Virginia. We have Andrew Downs from the Appalachian Trails Conservancy, um, which has had a, both an active advocacy program for designation of parts of the AT, for work associated with the AT, and for stewardship along the AT, including its all wilderness areas. And Eric Geibelstein from the, Society, or from the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, um, which is a stewardship group that covers um, many areas in the Southeast and is, has an active wilderness stewardship program. So I will turn it over to you three gentlemen. So Mark um, or Andrew, yeah. whichever you've decided was going to start. Sure, uh, Mark, you're up, and I can I can share my screen with your presentation up, or if you can, that works too. Okay, if you can share it with your screen, that would be great, Andrew. That should just mean I can hit the the forward button, right? No, I'd have to move your slide for you. Yeah. I'll okay, show Andrew. The... All right. Well, my name is Mark Miller, and I've been. Um, working on wilderness in the state of Virginia for almost 20 years. And what uh, Eric, Andrew, and I are going to be talking about is the case for wilderness stewardship advocacy. And what I'm actually going to talk about is wilderness advocacy itself uh, and how we go about advocating for wilderness and how a stewardship organization helped in the development of the Ridge and Valley Act of 2009. And before I start though, I would like to say that about 10 years ago, um, I was working with another collaborative and somebody on that collaborative said to me, the problem with wilderness advocates is you get areas designated and then you forget about them. And my response to him was, no, that's not true. And he says, when was the last time that you helped maintain a trail? And I drew a blank because I've never done that before. And it was shortly after that, that I uh, told the Forest Service, uh, the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest that I would start maintaining the Rich Hall Trail. And I've now been doing that for 10 years. It's tough work, but it's a lot of fun. So why don't we, next slide. And I'm so the Ridge and Valley Act began with an idea, and that idea came out of something called the Virginia Mountain Treasures. And the Virginia Mountain Treasures was put together by the Wilderness Society for the forest planning for the Jefferson National Forest. And that that this publication was released in May of 1999. It had 67,000 areas. Uh, there are 67 areas and about 270,000 acres that we felt might be suitable for wilderness on the Jefferson. Next. Sorry, it's not um, advancing for some reason. There we, go. there we go. So in order for this to work, we brought together a group of people uh, that became known as the Radford Coalition. And you can see there some of the groups that uh, were a part of that organization. And we took that 67 areas and we began a whittling process down to those areas that you can see listed on your, uh, on your right. But I would like to point out that one of the primary people that was involved in that process was the Appalachian Trail Conference. And um, 
and there were by the by the and the person involved was a gentleman by the name of Mike Dawson, and later Teresa Martinez. Okay. And so I'm going to tell you the story of Crawfish Valley. Um, Crawfish Valley, and that's that's a quote from the district ranger about the discussions on Crawfish Valley, to be one B or not to be one B, that is the question. And I thought that was actually pretty clever. And one B in the Jefferson was a wilderness study area designation. And there was a lot of disagreement about what Crawfish Valley should look like. Next one. So Crawfish Valley was the largest um, roadless area on the Jefferson National Forest. And it had a lot of conflicts. Uh, one of those is that the AT passes right through the middle of it. It has lots of trails. There was strong support for wilderness because of the 18,000 acres, but there was also a lot of mountain bike activity. And then top of that, it was a great place to hunt and fish. And so all of those different communities, and then including the timber and the game industry, we pretty much had an endless discussion about how the Crawfish Valley should be managed. And the forest planners got tired of that discussion and asked that we put together a consensus proposal. All right, next one. And so, the Appalachian Trail Conference at the time uh, through Mike Dawson and the Virginia Wilderness Committee through a gentleman by the name of Jim Murray brought together a whole group of people to actually talk about how we should view management in the Crawfish Valley area. And they, we, it, the group eventually submitted a proposal of nearly 8,000 acres of wilderness study of wilderness study area encompassed by a larger national scenic area. And in the final plan, it was not recommended. However, as I point out, the, the, the importance of that discussion proved that collaboration can work. And we took that concept of collaboration and then took it to the larger Jefferson National Forest during the course of the forest planning process. Next one, Andrew. And so the final outcome um, of all of that discussion came to be a 5,400 acre Bear Creek National Scenic Area. There was no wilderness included, but, um, and we also proposed another, the, the remainder of that area that's in gold up there also be a part of the National Scenic Area, but it was not approved by the Wythe County Board of Supervisors and so you have that nice straight line there um, that is the, the boundary between Smith County and Wythe County. But the, it still came to show that collaboration can work. And we feel like that's an important aspect of wilderness advocacy um, in, in developing proposals for wilderness. All right. So um, that advocacy began a whole series of discussion between um, different user groups. Some of the, the ATC with Teresa Martinez, the Virginia Wilderness Committee, and for Brush Mountain and Brush Mountain East, we also brought in the bear hunters because the bear hunters were very interested in the possibility of wilderness. The next one. Crawfish Valley was, of course, just one of those areas of uh, force collaboration with force stewards. And, um, and it, it ended up being a collaboration between ATC, BW, the Virginia Wilderness Committee, and mountain bikers, because mountain bikers um, felt a strong interest in the area. Next one. Lewis Fork and Little Wilson Creek. Um, 
the AT runs through both of these areas, and as a result of its advocacy by the ATC and other uh, other groups and organizations, there were additions added to both Little Wilson and Lewis Fork um, in the final plan for the Jefferson, as well as in the bill for the uh, the Ridge and Valley Act. Raccoon Branch and Seng Mountain. A Raccoon Branch became a wilderness area and Seng Mountain um, uh, became a national scenic area. And this again was through discussions between ATC, VWC and the mountain bike community. And this, this area itself actually predated what happened at Crawfish Valley. And again, it was Mike Dawson with the ATC who brought together some folks, uh, somebody from the Virginia Wilderness Committee and some people in Damascus to actually talk about Raccoon Branch being wilderness. And they actually came up with this agreement between Raccoon Branch and Seng Mountain, Raccoon Branch being a wilderness and Seng Mountain becoming a national scenic area. And again, it's just like sort of building on this concept that when you talk, you're more likely to come to an agreement. Mountain Lake and Peters Mountain. Um, additions were added to the Mountain Lake Wilderness and to the Peters Mountain Wilderness. And the additions to um, the Mountain Lake Wilderness actually created the largest wilderness area in the state of Virginia at 15, just over 15,000 acres. But again, it was a result of collaboration between the Appalachian Trail Conference, you're called the Conservancy now, right, Andrew? Thank you. <clears throat> um, the Virginia Wilderness Committee and the bear hunting community. And for instance, with the bear hunting community on this one, we had a map that included a road that was used by paraplegic hunters. And I sat down at a table with a bear hunter and she said, we can't support this because that particular road is very important to some of people in our, our hunting group. And so we talked about how the area would look and we drew new lines. And then she said, the bear hunters will support this. And they were very critical in making that happen. So the Ridge, the Ridge and Valley Act was part of the Omnibus Lands Bill of 2009. And the, the areas that you see listed are the areas that were um, the new standalones that were created, two new national scenic areas, and then acreages added to several different uh, wilderness areas. And I would point out that Stone Mountain, Kimberling Creek, and Shaver's Run are the only areas that do not actually have the AT running through them. And so it was the, the advocacy of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy was very important in moving this bill from a concept to a law. So the way I'd like to close is that, like I, at, at the beginning, I was one of those parties that was very guilty of working to get areas designated, but not uh, actually doing any maintenance work. And thanks to Merrick Smith from TNC, um, I, I was kind of pushed into this. And so I, I bring exchange students from all over the world who help with me doing trail maintenance work. And here's a couple of pictures of them. But I've had kids from all over the world doing uh, trail work and they all love it. So it, it kind of comes down to wilderness maintainers come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and they should be active participants in efforts to extend protection from concept to Congress. And with that, I will turn it over to Andrew Downs. Thanks, Mark. And let me just get my Eric's presentation up real quick. Uh, there we go. All right, Ian, can everybody see me okay? Hear me okay? Yeah, looks good. Great. So appreciate that. Um, 
recap, Mark, about significant additions to the wilderness and, and obvious um, benefit to the Appalachian Trail experience. Um, a lot of the folks on the presentation today will probably be familiar with some of those names, Mike Dawson and, and Teresa Martinez. So if you're out there somewhere, uh, appreciate y'all's work. I, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the Great American Outdoors Act, which I think is something that's been on people's mind for the last couple of years in just a, uh, a little bit of a, a brief history about the development of that and, and really how stewards played a role in, um, in not only getting that off the ground, but getting it signed in the fall. So, and while I'm doing this presentation, since I'm missing you all here in Roanoke, I have a suite of pictures that um, kind of capture a little bit of what you guys are missing out on um, as maybe a way to connect with the region. Anyway, so they don't have a ton of relevancy to this uh, presentation, that's the point. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of you folks know early in the, uh, early in the uh, process of developing um, the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, it, it was initially, or something similar, was initially called the Restore Our Parks Act, and there was separate LWCF funding uh, going on uh, a, a separate but kind of connected track. And a lot of that, the impetus for the Restore Our Parks Act came from Park Service partners hearing and um, wanting to address the uh, deferred maintenance backlog in our national parks. It's something, you know, I, I work in six national parks, and you hear about this all the time. And I think stewards are really critical in, in um, bringing an effort to bear on how actually addressing that letting Congress know that this was, a, this was a priority for them as volunteers and people who enjoy the park. So that was part of the impetus for Restore Our Parks Act. Um, but obviously that act being very NPS focused, National Park Service focused, um, eliminated the participation in that, in the benefit of that act just to National Park service and, and just the DOI agencies and really left the forest out. And that was yet another role for uh, stewards and partners uh, to play here was to, was to talk to Congress about how important it would be to include uh, other agencies like the Forest Service in what was called the Restore Our Parks Act at the time. Um, there was a little bit of a challenge to this and, and something that we had to understand as advocates because adding a, a Department of Agriculture um, component to this very Department of Interior focus um, might make some, create some procedural hurdle, hurdles of, of collateral referral. So, so bringing in another committee um, and, and really complicating the issue a lot. And so hearing back from our congressional partners that there were some challenges um, that including the Forest Service might um, you know, might create with something that I think advocates had to be really uh, sensitive to and really understanding about as they continued to try and be successful in bringing uh, agencies like the Forest Service um, to be included in, uh, in the Restore Our Parks Act. Um, so it, it became, uh, I think, valuable for a variety of reasons to roll that LWCF full funding legislation and the Restore Our Parks legislation in together. There are some key senators up for re-election that really wanted a big win, um, something really impactful that they could point to. Um, and, they, and they were really able to kind of drill down on this collateral, collateral referral issue and streamline that a little bit. And that was with the involvement of, of Senator Joe Manchin from Virginia, who, uh, who was lead on both of those, um, both of those bills. But even after those the Restore Our Park Act, Parks Act and LWCF full funding got rolled in together, still didn't have the U.S. Forest Service. And there was this, um, there was a variety of issues uh, still kind of hanging out there. Um, and so stewards had to continually uh, kind of beat the drums to include the forest and really do a lot of education about how much recreation goes on in national forests to some key uh, senators and house members. And, and one really um, critical um, partnership that emerged was with Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee. And uh, you can see here uh, the picture is from 
is not from the Roanoke region. This is the only one that's kind of relative to the presentation, uh, but it's from his, uh, but it's from his state um, and on the AT. Um, so I thought I would include that. You know, one of the reasons that I think Senator Alexander got so involved is that he had a, a really strong existing relationship, not only with the, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, but with wilderness advocates, um, a lot in a large, um, a large partnership of public land stewards and um, and partner groups had really worked with his office on uh, a new state park that had come in to uh, to East Tennessee that was in and around the AT uh, Center. It's called Center Lamar Alexander Rocky Point State Park. Um, so there was already these great relationships that were in place. So when we were able to come to him and talk about the problems we had uh, with the fact that the Forest Service was kind of excluded from that legislation, not only was, was he a knowledgeable ear, you know, he already knew that the AT was on national forest land, for example, um, but he was really motivated to continue with his legacy on public lands and, and really do something about it. And we were able to really use the AT as an example and other national scenic trails as an example of, um, of areas that cross jurisdictions uh, and then would, it would, um, if the Forest Service wasn't included in this legislation, it would really create this kind of uneven playing field for a lot of our resources uh, in the national trail system that um, that cross all these boundaries. Uh, and that, that really resonated, I think, um, with his office. Um, and so really what I think the, the key take home of this of this process around the Great American Outdoors Act is the role that stewards played almost on every step of the way. I mean, if you recall, early I was saying that it was, stewards were key in prioritizing the deferred maintenance backlog at the Park Service um, to their members of Congress saying, hey, this is a problem for us. We are, we're out there trying to do work. The Park Service needs to meet us halfway and, and really um, be able to support that work on this deferred maintenance backlog. And right now they, they didn't have the priority. So stewards saying, hey, we need to uh, we need to do something about it. And then a lot of those um, a lot of the information that's key to how a, a successful bill would be crafted really rely on stewards uh, as well, saying, hey, you know, even the Appalachian Trail is a unit of the national park system, it's on national forest land, really might create this sort of um, uneven playing field for what should be a uniform experience, no matter whose jurisdiction the trail lands on. Um, and so there was kind of a, a, a element of education that took on uh, stewards or stewards took on to say, hey, a lot of people recreate on the national forest land and uh, they have a deferred maintenance backlog too and we should really, really do something about that. And then we were able to use um, some existing relationships that we had been cultivating for a long time. And if you've been any of, uh, if you've been on any of the webinars that we've been doing throughout the fall, just about uh, advocacy, you'll know that one of the big take homes of those presentations is, is how to establish long-term relationships with these legislators, and how important they are to your success. Um, but the knowledge on the ground, the knowledge of the steward is, is really critical. And so it, it really is a kind of keystone in our collective ability to develop good legislation, and good policy, um, because it, it, they're grounded in, in reality. So to speak, stewards are out there every day, all, all the time. And so um, we need to capture that knowledge and bring it to bear uh, as advocates to Congress to make sure that as they craft legislation, it's as valuable as possible to our wilderness and public lands. Um, I think that's all I have. And then Eric, will, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. And Eric, I'm happy to advance your slides as well. Sure, Andrew, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this is a story about uh, uh, how stewardship can, can, and boots on the ground work can support um, advocacy efforts for wilderness designation. You know, we heard from Mark and Andrew about one, stewards advocating for wilderness directly um, through the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And then from Andrew, how, how stewardship groups can advocate for additional stewardship dollars and support from Congress. 
And this is going to be that third sort of how our boots on the ground work can go to support uh, wilderness advocacy efforts um, across the nation, really. Um, and so this is going to be a little case study in Virginia. Um, and really, it it's going to show the importance of relationship building, partnership building, um, and actual boots and sweat equity, uh, and how those those efforts can support ongoing advocacy efforts uh, in, in your region. Um, and so I began working in Virginia regularly in 2017. I opened up our office uh, here in Roanoke uh, then. And, you know, part of my first uh, year of work here really was to start building partnerships and relationships with the Forest Service up here. So at the, at, at the forest level and at the district level, um, to hear what those needs are for wilderness stewardship, and also to begin building relationships with nonprofit and volunteer groups across the the um, the the George Washington and Jefferson National Forests uh, to build those relationships and help grow capacity for wilderness stewardship across the uh, the 23 wilderness areas that we have here in Virginia, um, and one of those needs was in Ramsey's Draft Wilderness. Um, Ramsey's Draft is, is a small wilderness. Uh, it's mid-sized for, for Virginia, I suppose. I think it's around right around 6,000 acres or 8,000 acres, one of the two. Um, and it's a really amazing area. It's, a, it's, it's got a whole, it's essentially the whole headwaters of the Ramsey's Draft uh, that it protects and um, has some really remote areas for Virginia and tough to access um, or, or, you know, tough for stewardship groups to access. And so <clears throat> I began working with the district and um, with one of the major maintainers at the time that we're going to hear from and meet here in our ne next session, Lynn Cameron. And Lynn is an amazing volunteer um, who uh, works with the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, and then she also has an advocacy effort uh, called the Friends of Shenandoah Mountain um, that she's been working on for uh, near uh, at least 20 years, I, I, I would say, maybe more, um, but an advocacy effort to, to protect the, the landscape that includes Ramsey's Draft and is an additional, you know, um, uh, nearly 90,000 acres beyond that. Um, and so hearing from the district and hearing from Lynn, there was a need for um, sort of deep backcountry um, stewardship to remove blowdowns that had been of, of, of um, old growth, old growth hemlock trees that had fallen over and had died and fallen over um, that had been there for years. And so there's a need for stewardship groups that could access the backcountry uh, pretty easily and do that that difficult um, complex work easily, and that was kind of out, right in our our wheelhouse. And so, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, oh, we got switched around a little bit, Andrew. That should have been the first slide. Um, if you can go to the maybe the next one. Uh, I think we're all kind of uh, messed up. If you want to uh, stop sharing your screen, I can share my screen real quick. Sorry about this, folks. A little technical difficulties. Um, but essentially, um, we, we got back there in 2017 with our Naval Academy uh, midshipmen and we're able to clear all those trees in the in the most remote section of uh, the the wilderness, um, which is great. And so, uh, at that time, you know, I had been working with Lynn for nearly a year, and we decided to sign on to her proposal of, and support her proposal for additional um, wilderness designation and national scenic area designation that she'll talk about here in a bit. Um, and so um, that's just the beginning of the work. We continued to work with, with uh, in Ramsey's draft and do some more of that remote work that needed to be done. 
Um, this is our Naval Academy crew uh, working on a remote section of the Bald Ridge Trail um, that is both hard to reach and uh, a lot of work and it, from a dry campsite. So we had to set up all of that um, crazy infrastructure uh, to be able to do that work. Um, and so we continued to build that capacity in 2018 uh, through that program. We also had a wilderness ranger out there that was doing education work, um, was, was collecting data to help uh, wilderness stewardship performance metrics um, and just kind of connecting with the community, educating them about wilderness. Um, and while we were doing that, all of that, um, Lynn was continuing to build this amazing community of stewards and advocates uh, to, to kind of dovetail with her stewardship work. Um, and, you know, she, she was using the example of SAW's work um, to help build uh, support uh, for the, the effort in the communities that surround them. You know, communities want that access uh, to wild spaces. They want safe trails, safe access to these places and that's what's important to those communities. Um, and uh, the, that following year, we're also completing wilderness character monitoring out there, um, getting, getting the forest service ready for a uh, successful sort of stewardship of the area, getting that data um, going and, and good to go. Um, and, you know, as this capacity for stewardship grows, locally through Lynn's efforts and the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club's efforts, that's where SAW sort of has to reevaluate through partnership and through these relationships, how we're coming to the table to support them. Um, and during that time, we also become a cooperator for the Forest Service Crosscut SAW program. <clears throat> and so our roles, like I said, shift at that point and at this point, we're just sort of supporting the local stewardship groups uh, through, through um, hosting volunteer efforts, educating the public about wilderness, building new relationships. Like if you can see in some of these pictures, um, building relationships with the National uh, uh, Conservation Corps uh, and Triple C team that, that would come through every year. We, we do a volunteer day where we bring these young folks that are engaged with the um, um, with AmeriCorps out to do stewardship work. Uh, and then we're also uh, completing training. So this last year we uh, certified about eight folks from the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club in crosscut saw use so that they can take those skills and be able to use them in Ramsey's Draft and also beyond Ramsey's Draft in that uh, Shenandoah Mountain National Scenic Area propo proposal. Uh, and we also trained them on how to do tread work. So um, we're sort of building that capacity for wilderness stewardship um, and skills at the local level so that there's, there's this already uh, um, robust community of support for stewardship before these places get um, uh, protected and, and uh, uh, designated as wilderness. Yeah, so the next, the, the next uh, sort of role that SAWS is going to play here and has been playing um, is just for, you know, support that additional capacity for stewardship uh, through training, through um, volunteer engagement, through community engagement, um, and then also to continue uh, providing support uh, uh, directly for places in that area that, that are hard to, to access um, for projects that are beyond the scope of sort of the, their abilities and capacity at this point. Um, and, and we kind of go from there. Um, this is just to say that um, it, this can be exhausting work and tiresome, but uh, super worthwhile. And that's uh, me taking a little break, <laughs> getting water up to that dry campsite. And I think, we're a little bit behind time, but I'm wondering if uh, we have time for some questions, Randy. 
Yeah, for sure, uh, Ian here, but yes, Eric, um, we can go another few minutes, but we do wanna make sure we get a break before the top of the hour, so. Uh, we do have one thought provoking question in the chat or in the q and I should say, um, that I think could be interesting for folks to address. And I'm just gonna read this. Um, first of all, thank you all for that, those presentations. It's really great to get some history. Um, and then some kind of current day events. I spent a lot of my early years of volunteer trail maintenance in the wilderness areas of Southwest Virginia. Wish I was there. Uh, so Stephen Wood was asking in terms of Mark's examples of wilderness stewardship being the quality of trail maintenance, how we move beyond the common idea of wilderness stewardship being limited to trail maintenance, while hiking trails are a major part of most wilderness areas, having maintained trails are not mentioned in the Act, the Wilderness Act, uh, and a minimal part of that Act. How do, we do, how do we respond to someone who thinks wilderness areas are, quote unquote, forgotten because trails are not being maintained according to a certain standard? There is so much more to the wilderness areas ecosystem beyond the trail that is being managed or not managed. Do you want me, gentlemen, would you like me to take the first shot at that? Sure. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that's an actual very good comment to make because wilderness is far more than just trails. It's water quality. It's, uh, it provides a lot of ecosystem services. It helps to protect a lot of threatened and, and endangered species. And I think that in Lynn's work, as Eric has talked about Friends of Shenandoah Mountain and the Shenandoah Mountain National Scenic Area, Lynn has made a point to, to address the issue of trail maintenance work, but Lynn also works very diligently at pointing out the fact that protecting these areas protects the water quality for the cities of Harrisonburg and Stanton, that it protects the, um, the biological resources, some of which are only found on Shenandoah Mountain. And so I, I do think that it is important to understand that wilderness is more than just trails. It is, it is a whole suite of things, many of which are recognized in the, um, the, the Wilderness Act itself. And from, from my point, uh, one of the things that SAWS does is they do a lot of wilderness monitoring. And there are some places in Virginia that are really hard to get into. And because I've been through these places um, more times than I can count, I'm fairly familiar with how you get into them. And so I actually work with SAWS on occasion to help do some of that wilderness monitoring as well. And I think that's actually a critical aspect of looking at wilderness and what wilderness has to offer. Yeah, thanks Mark. And I'll, I'll just add as you, um, and I think it's really important, um, at least out here, where there's a lot of communities that are near wilderness, um, where wilderness uh, trails often look kind of like the front country at some times, their level of use. And when we're trying to establish and talk about the variety of benefits that wilderness has, I think it's important to really drill down on the local message um, to the communities that are in and around those specific wilderness areas. And so that key and core constituency um, becomes um, really knowledgeable about the variety of benefits that they're gonna immediately have from, um, from this land being managed as wilderness. Um, they're in, you know, specific to the topic of this workshop, you know, they're key advocates, they're key voters, they're key constituents, so making sure that those local groups um, are really knowledgeable about the variety of values is important. And that, that may mean tailoring the type of messaging um, that you're bringing to bear on these conversations. That may mean, you know, uh, affecting a communication strategy that really starts uh, really locally. It uh, could mean a lot of different things, but I think strategically making sure you focus on the adjacent communities, the local communities as the, a beginning point for that broader message of, of wilderness value, it's really important.
Yeah, I think Mark and Andrew really said it pretty well. I mean, yeah, I think in the wilderness community, I'll just add that in the wilderness community, we know that it's a broader resource. Um, and and like Andrew said, you gotta you gotta respond to different um, user groups accordingly, right? Or interest groups or stakeholders accordingly. Um, and some of those folks may be water quality or, or wildlife, um, you know, wildlife habitat, like the bear hunters, um, they realize that wilderness is a, is, is a, the appropriate resource for their, um, their enjoyment of the wilderness. And so, uh, that's why they're involved in at the table, um, because they know that wilderness protection is, is good for, for bear habitat. And, um, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna come to the table when they see their, um, sort of uh, interest area at the <laughs> be, being either threatened or, or supported. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Mark. Um, some, some great uh, stories and background for some really special work you all are doing down there, Southwest Virginia. So thank you. And I'll just point folks to um, Bill Hodge left a nice or an informative comment in the chat. I encourage folks to read um, related to this conversation. And with that, I think uh, we're gonna wrap it up, Randy. Yes, Eric. Yes, Ian. We're gonna take a break now and come back at two o'clock Eastern time for Lynn Cameron and Tom Engel um, talking about the wilderness stewardship and advocacy in the Shenandoah mountain area. I think you'll wanna uh, come back and join us for that. I, um, we're going to work on our technical difficulties. If you do get kicked out of the webinar, just call back in in about five minutes or about five minutes before the top of the hour. We'll have things restored back to normal. If not, um, 